Hello, my name is Pavel and this is a lecture originally delivered in Italian Ill School in the summer of 2019. Just afterwards I recorded that, uh, more or less the same as it was during the school, well with probably omitting few unrelevant details. Well, we were talking about scanning transmission electron microscopy STEM, where we focus our electron beam into the small probe scan it across the sample with recording well as a minimum we record high angle scattered electrons which forms an image but also we can install uh, electron energy loss spectrometer at the NIS and energy dispersive x-ray detector at the site and turn our image into so-called spectrum images where each pixel is equipped with a spectrum. As a result we get some kind of data cube, there are a lot of data point, and our question is how we can efficiently treat this huge amount of data. One option is uh, multivariate statistical analysis, MSA. Well, before explaining to you what is MSA, I would stress what what it is not. Well, MSA is not spectra fitting. You know, spectra fitting implies uh, a model uh, with certain parameters and it tries to find parameters fitting best your experimental data. Uh, in contrast, MSA uh, doesn't assume any model, it's mostly unsupervised approach. Second, uh, Spectra fitting always uh, works with an individual spectrum. If there are many spectra, the same procedure is repeated several times. MSA is completely different. It ultimately requires a lot of spectra as an input, because MSA is statistical methods, so it requires a lot of statistics. Also, MSA is different from a simple smoothing filter. You know, uh, smoothing uh, sometimes also can uh, improve our data, say, uh, reduce noise, but it's always accompanied with uh, loss of uh, spatial resolution, like in this image. In contrast, MSA is able to denoise your data without uh, losing its spatial resolution. How it works, you will see, you will see later. In this slide I compare uh, spectrum fitting, smoothing filter and MSA according different criteria, use of a priori information, pixel neighborhood, uh, the effect of the number of pixels, and you see that uh, these three methods are indeed uh, very different. Uh, they are, I would say, in different niches and sometimes they are even complementary relative to each other. Yeah, from this table, uh, the most important is uh, for us is the fact, I already mentioned that, that MSA ultimately requires a lot of statistics as an input, because MSA is, is uh, statistical methods. I said methods because it's not one method, uh, it's uh, rather a family of, uh, of many methods. You probably uh, heard some names like multivariate curve resolution or factor analysis or non-negative matrix factorization and so on. Yeah, when I first started to learn this area I felt a little bit uh, frustrative. So many methods, they are so abstract, complicated, uh, yeah. But no panic. They are of course very different methods, but all of them are based at the same idea, and that is dimensionality reduction. That's quite important. I heard that in the world literature, for instance, uh, there are only three topics, essentially three topics, love, death and travel. And all great novelists, uh, they didn't invent a new topic, but just explored one of the, one of the three old topics. 
Similarly, in data treatment there are only few basic ideas and one of them is exactly this dimensionality reduction. So that's why I strongly recommend you try to pick up the essence of this idea and then probably one day you apply it in some unexpected area and become famous. So what is this idea, dimensionality reduction? Consider this on example of principal component analysis, PCA. Imagine some gas chamber where an unknown gas is injected and we have two detectors. One is measuring hydrogen atoms and another is measuring oxygen atoms and both registrations are quite dirty. As a result, our measurements look uh, rather noisy. Let's try to improve that. Let's plot uh, a joint distribution of both detectors. Like that. Here hydrogen clicks, here oxygen clicks and points are joint events. Note that time is excluded from that plot, only hydrogen and oxygen coordinates. Let's call such space factor space. And immediately we see that uh, there is a special direction here. Directions where counts from oxygen and, ox and uh, hydrogen consolidate. Yeah, PCA uh, finds such special direction let's call it eigenvector, PCA finds that with the criterion of maximum data variance. Here it varies a lot, in other directions not so much. Ok, here we find our eigenvector. Note that uh, this eigenvector is uh, twice more incli inclinated to the hydrogen X than to oxygen X. Is it possible that uh, in reality there are no individual oxygen or hydrogen atoms but rather a water molecule? Maybe. Because we see in joint clicks some clear correlation and any correlation must have an underlying reason. Then we rotate our axis such as uh, the eigenvector becomes a new basis vector, like that. We have new two new axes, let's call them component, component 1 and component 2. First component is probably related to water molecule and the second component is of unknown meaning. Probably just noise. Ok, let's assume that the second component is unimportant and we project all data to the first component, like that. So if we were right, if the second component is just noise, it means that with this operation we removed significant portion of noise from our data. And if we plot it back against, against time, the data would appear greatly denoised. You see. Uh, we can also rotate back and cost it in the original coordinates, oxygen and hydrogen. Still it will be denoised comparing to, 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 to the original untreated set. Well, I would like to stress we didn't assume the existence of water molecule. The method is unsupervised. The water molecule appears rather as an output. You may conclude something about the water molecule or might avoid any conclusions if your target is simply denoising the data. Is that clear? Let's make case a bit more complicated. Let's add the third detector measuring nitrogen atoms. And now our vector space is three-dimensional. Secretly, I would tell you that uh, there are not only water molecules injected, but also ammonia molecules coming into the chamber. So that's why nitrogen detector is needed. But we proceed exactly the same way. We first identify the direction of the uh, maximal variance of data then the direction of the second significant variance of data and that would be our first and second principal components 
let's rotate uh, coordinate axis at and look at the plane formed by first and second component here interesting is that right now the directions of our principal components do not coincide with the directions of propagation of water and ammonium molecules but rather represent their linear combination but you will see that for uh, denoising for denoising pupils it doesn't matter we look now at the plane h on like that and we see clearly that the third component is nothing but noise and we, we can we can safely remove that it means that we removed the significant portion of noise from our data i hope you already got an idea so we identify some important directions in the factor space and illuminate all unimportant dimensions say we project our hypercube to hyperplane of lower dimensionality and my example was of course uh, very simplified in reality stem eels data typically consist of several thousand energy channels and with clever algorithm we can reduce that to just few few principal components that means great huge huge compression and great great denoising what about algorithms there is a variety of different algorithms they differ uh, by for instance criteria how you find a special direction PCA use uh, the criterion of the highest data variance because data should vary somehow in in the important direction there is also independent component analysis ICA and in contrast to PCA ICA assumes that uh, data distribution should differ maximally from Gaussian distribution in the important direction because you know uh, Gaussian distribution is a strong indication for noise behavior and everything for what is far from that might be assumed to, to, to be important okay such a way we extract the first special direction first component but one component is not enough we need more components and we find another special directions with exactly same criteria but now with constraints N namely the second special direction should be perpendicular to the first one okay then you probably want to find the third special direction it should be perpendicular to both uh, first and second one and so on extract as many special directions as you want as many special uh, as many components as you want what is the difference between principal component analysis and multivariate curve resolution largely in definitions if we don't go into details PCA operates uh, with uh, the directions in the factor space while MCR costs data in terms of uh, points in the factor space and these points called sometimes pure spectra or end members and as you see from that picture they usually have a clear meaning actually they are supposed to be a to be signatures of uh, pure compounds constituting your, your your data set well still any given point in the factor space can be equally built from uh, the PCA basis vectors or uh, as a linear combination of uh, MCR uh, pure spectra the results would be same the same final spectra so these approaches are equivalent okay as a first look uh, the language of multivariate curve resolution uh, sounds more clear because meaning of the n spectra is clear but i should say that uh, conceptually pca is simpler and the algorithms for pca are better developed 
Thus, uh, the multivariate curve resolution methods often use uh, PCA as a first step and then build something more sophisticated on top of PCA. Uh, such strategy uh, is used, for instance, in the well-known software packages by team of Paul Cotula or by Dobigion. Well, PCA is useful, but PCA is not a magic stick. There are certain limitations. It's quite easy to find the preferential direction in the factor space in that situation, when data vary a lot. But you might guess it's quite difficult if the meaningful data variation actually approaches uh, the variation of uh, natural noise, like here. Well, such limitations were quantified by Bohm Nadler. And here I show you a short resume of his theory. He concluded that uh, the PCA component can be reliably extracted only if uh, the signal-to-noise ratio uh, exceeds a certain threshold. Namely, uh, the, uh, the, the meaningful data variance uh, against the variance of noise should exceed a square root of uh, the number of energy channels against the number of pixels. If signal-to-noise is below this uh, threshold, uh, the PCA component is uh, is irreversibly lost. It's washed out. So you see that uh, PCA efficiency improves as a square root of the number of stamp pixels. And that is why uh, right now it's a good time to apply PCA uh, in, ILS, in, 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 in ILS stem. 20 years ago, uh, our typical spectrum image was uh, something like 10 by 10 pixels say 100 spectra, and that was insufficient. Right now, thanks to the hardware suppliers, we easily get many thousands of spectra, and in this new reality, uh, PCA can help a lot. Okay, now let's describe PCA in a little bit more formal terms. Uh, mathematically, PCA deals with uh, matrices, so we have first to rearrange our data into the matrix form. Uh, a matrix like that, uh, where uh, spectra are placed on rows, and each row represents an individual pixel, an individual stamp probe. Uh, originally, these pixels can be arranged differently, 3D, 2D, 4D, uh, doesn't matter. We can always recost it into 1D train, because uh, for PCA, the actual neighborhood of pixels is unimportant. Just remember the correspondence between the uh, row index and uh, the position of these pixels in the original data format. Okay, as soon as we have a data matrix, we assume that uh, there is a certain correlation among spectra in it, and we want to find this correlation. We build the covariance matrix, uh, we rotate to make it diagonal, and this way uh, we make all, all correlations clear. This is actually a well-known uh, singular value decomposition, SVD. Okay, as soon as we found the SVD basis, we can easily recost our data matrix in terms of eigenspectra and the contributions. Another name for eigenspectra is loadings, and for contributions, another name is scores. So, in fact, we uh, represented our matrix now as a multiplication of two matrices, loadings matrix and score matrix. Well, actually, we have performed already the principal component decomposition. Each eigenspectrum and its contribution forms a so-called principal component. It's also quite important to sort principal component in this matrix according to some principle. 
uh, in PCA uh, we uh, sort them according the data variance in scores. At the first place we uh, put the principal component with the highest variance of score, then uh, lower variance, still lower, and so on. Well, the next step of the PCA analysis is quite crucial. We assume that the only few major PCA components are important and the rest are not relevant, represent probably just noise and can be thrown away like that. So what we did, actually we uh, performed a huge compression of our data matrix in the energy dimension. And I should stress, it's a lossy compression, so you, you remove a lot of information, irreversibly remove. But uh, if everything went right, what you removed was just noise, so you don't suffer. And of course, at the end, you have to convert your denoised data matrix back to the original format. And if everything went right, your data cube should appear greatly denoised. Okay, now we are well prepared to apply PCA for our stuff, ILS spectrum imaging. Let's do it. And quite often you might be disappointed. What I hear from people, yeah, it sometimes works, sometimes not, sometimes it looks like dangerous distortion of the data. Yeah, I agree, but basically exactly these arguments were put against electricity when it was starting to be introduced somewhere, somewhere at the end of 19th century. People uh, didn't understand that, for instance, two wires should be connected to a lamp, it must be connected properly, otherwise shortcut and fire. Yeah, I mean, that's all evident for you, but not for people of 19th century. Therefore, some barriers of understanding should be overcame. Very similarly, some precautions are needed to apply PCA properly to use. Otherwise, your work is stuck. First, PCA works best if noise is uh, more or less same everywhere, so-called homocedastic noise. But in reality, our ill spectra are corrupted with Poissonian noise, which is not homocedastic. It increases with increasing uh, the signal level. And unfortunately, our typical ill spectrum can show quite strong variation of intensity across the energy channels. The background at the left side might be much higher than the useful signal at the right side. And that means that the noisy variation of background at the left might easily override the useful variation of signal at the right side. The workaround is well known. We know that Poissonian noise increases at the square root of the signal level. Let's just rescale our data set. Let's normalize it to the square root of uh, the mean spectrum, spectrum averaged over all pixels. And if uh, there is a strong variation of intensity uh, from pixel to pixel, uh, we can also uh, normalize to the square root of uh, the mean image. Okay, the rest we proceed exactly as before, but now loading matrix, score matrix, and denoise data matrix are all uh, weighted. And of course, at the end, do not forget to unweight the deno denoised data matrix because we need to restore the original, uh, the original scale. That was only the first bottleneck. The next problem is coming. Unfortunately, PCA is not quite robust against heavy data outliers. Even a single pixel situated far away from the main distribution might noticeably distort your PCA results. In else, uh, such uh, outliers appear mainly due to so-called X-ray spikes. 
the events when uh, generated x-rays eventually hit your electron detector and uh, cause some spurious peaks in spectrum yeah then you cannot calculate your pca loadings uh, accurately say a blue vector here is what is supposed to be uh, a true eigenspectrum and red is what is distorted due to the presence of outlier in order to restore the correctness of treatment you have to uh, identify such outliers in your data set before I or in the course of PCA identify them and isolate remove then your loadings will be again correct I should stress that such uh, x-ray spikes not only contaminate contaminate the eigenspectra like in the upper example you see there are some some peaks but the overall shape is more or less the same but like in the second in the low example they can noticeably change the overall shape of the of the eigenspectra and that is already very very harmful so you ultimately must to get rid of outliers if you wish your PCA analysis to be accurate another challenging question is how should we truncate the principal components or in other words where should we put the border between the assumed meaningful components and the assumed noise components it's often not quite evident we are always in between two dangers uh, compromise the denoising or to distort the true signal the standard way how to truncate is so-called script plot it's just the plot of the component variance against the component index why it's called script plot you know in mountains we we have rocks and we have plateaus and there are also some transit regions where we find small stones called scree and when we step on such stones such scree we know we should take care because a uh, rock is nearby similarly in PCA we just visually determined point which looks like a scree and we put there our threshold and this strategy works more or less but it's always a bit subjective yeah it's always plus minus and due to such subjectivity it's quite difficult to incorporate such strategy into the automatic algorithms recently we suggested an alternative way let's look at the so-called scatter plot that is just 2d slice of the data distribution in the factor space remember we analyzed such slices when dealing with gas molecules at the beginning of our lecture okay now let's plot uh, the scatter plots of the consequent couples of pca components plot of first components again second second again third third again fourth and so on you see that initially the scatter plots can look very anisotropic but at a certain moment they become round more or less isotropic and that is because both constituting components now represent noise and noise you know is isotropic in all directions we can also quantify the anisotropy of the scatter plot and draw it as a function of the component index and now the threshold is very very evident at a certain point anisotropy comes to zero and then oscillates around zero it's much more objective criterion than script plot and also this is very easy to implement in automatic truncation algorithm well now we are slowly moving to the end of our presentation and we can relax a little bit just enjoy the results of our hard work images looking at images is more fun than struggling with abstract diagrams isn't it okay here is an example of ill spectrum image of a semiconductor device 
we extract elemental maps and we compare e elemental maps before and after PCA. I should stress that for fair comparison I set exactly same contrast limits for maps before and after PCA. So if maps visually look better, it's objectively better. So what we see, if the signal was strong from the beginning, like titanium, oxygen, nitrogen, it is not changed much after PCA. But that is good to check the consistency of our treatment. At least we don't distort our data. If the signal was weak, like in the case of silicon, KH, tantalum, aluminum, PCA can noticeably improve that. Another semiconductor device, the same effect of PCA. In this case, the silicon signal is quite strong because I use the LH, not KH. So silicon is not improved much, but the weaker signal are really denoised. And our main target in that case was minor boron content, which is almost unseen before PCA, but well visible after PCA. The same gate, but zoomed, and you start to see at the bottom of gate a thin hafnium oxide layer. And again, to see it clearly, you do need PCA. That is also true for the other elements. Well, these maps are good illustration of the fact that PCA denoising does not degrade special resolution. So you see, special resolution is still quite, quite high. Example from another area, the perovskite layered structure. And as usual, PCA doesn't change much the appearance of strong signals, but it denoises noticeably the weak signals. Look at oxygen. It's great, great denoising. And finally, some atomic resolution example. Again, perovskite structure. Before PCA, I could not resolve the kappa lattice, but it shows up very clearly after PCA. And even I see something for, for the oxygen lattice. At that point, I finish. My conclusions are MSA and particularly PCA are very useful for treatment of modern stem ills data. But you need some basic understanding of how it works, and you need some tips how to avoid the typical issues. Well, I acknowledge all people who helped me, and also the financial support from European and German funds. The basic version of the plugin you can download free at that site. Thank you.